So why are our studies of aging so important now? Well, it's because we are an aging society. Um, in the census of 2016, for the first time in Canada, there were more older Canadians, Canadians 65 years of age or greater, than children. For, uh, children would be um, uh, 14 years of age or under. So there are slightly more, 16.9% of the population were 65 and over, compared to 16.6% uh, who were 14 and under. Now this is a big change for our country. Um, in the latter part of the 19th century, the age that sort of split the Canadian population 50-50, 50% older, 50% younger, would, would be around 17 or 18 years. So you can see the dramatic change in, in the composition of our society. Now, there are many good things that happen as we grow older, but there are also some health challenges, um, and there are some possible consequences to the public purse. So there are many potential goals for studies of aging, but I think you would agree probably the most important ones are how best to promote healthy aging. How can we stay uh, young for as old as possible? Um, and also, what are strategies that can prevent or minimize any handicaps that might arise as we grow older? And then finally, we'd like to find more about therapeutic approaches, which could be medications, but also might be diet, physical activity, health practices, for conditions which disproportionately affect older individuals. And these conditions tend to be what we call chronic conditions, chronic medical conditions. Now, to achieve all these goals, we do require a better understanding of aging. We, we need to know more than an older person on average is different than a younger person. We have to understand what the differences are and how can we capitalize on the resources the, um, the aging individual has to minimize any adverse consequences that might arise because they are growing older. Now, the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging is what we call a longitudinal study. Now, like many uh, studies uh, done in health research uh, are what we call cross-sectional studies. You see a person once, you do some type of assessment, and then you'd leave that poor soul alone. In a longitudinal study, you follow people over time. You have repeated observations or evaluations of that same person over time. So you get serial measurements obtained on one group of subjects. Now because of the repeated observations at the level of the person, at the individual, you have a lot more power than these other studies, these cross-sectional studies, to observe uh, what we call the temporal order of events. What precedes, for example, a particular outcome, whether it's good or bad? What are the factors that predict people doing well or predict maybe not doing as well as we or they would hope? So what leads to what? A longitudinal study allows you to address this or look at it much better than other forms of study, studies. Now major concerns with longitudinal studies are the cost, uh, because you have to have uh, infrastructure in place for many years to see people repeatedly. And the length of time it takes to complete the study. Um, when this study finishes, I'll be about 80, 85 years of age. Um, and the loss of participants over time. You know, people would draw for a variety of reasons. And that withdrawal um, could kind of warp or skew your results. For example, if people who tend to do not as well would draw more uh, commonly, then you might get a, an excessively hopeful perspective of aging because all the people who are running the problems disappear from your study and vice versa. So you want to keep people in a study as best you can. Now we also need to remember in longitudinal studies that each generation is exposed to a very unique environment, a unique set of circumstances that coincides with their lifespan. And that could explain some differences we see with aging or between generations. Uh, and we always have to keep that in mind. Someone born in 1900 will experience a very different life or has experienced a very different life than someone born in 1954 like myself. Um, and we always have to keep that in mind. Now, the United Kingdom uh, probably has led the world in establishing longitudinal studies which have followed people over a long period of time. And I'll just give you an example of one. 
It's called the 1946 National Birth Cohort. That's sort of the short name for it, but it really, uh, the longer name is the MRC National Survey of Health and Development. So this was launched in 1946. Um, and it was developed to address two questions which were really important at the time in the United Kingdom. One question was, why was the birth rate dropping in the United Kingdom? And, and they were very worried about this because this was the, uh, the time, the era before emigration into England. And, the, and they were concerned that their population would stop, start dropping. And that might put them at a disadvantage, for example, in competing with other countries like Germany or Russia, the United States, which had a growing population. They would have fewer workers, for example. And there also was a great deal of interest in the distribution, use, and effectiveness of obstetrical and midwifery services. So that the study was launched in 1946 to answer those questions. So what they did is that they uh, enrolled everyone born on a week in March in 1946 in England. And of that larger group, they picked a smaller group that they enrolled in a study, that they agreed to go in the study, their mother and the child, and they were going to follow them. Initially, they were going to follow them only for a number of years, but uh, God forbid, they followed them all the way out to 2017, and they're still going. So people are now 71 years of age who were enrolled in that study. Uh, now, over time, the objectives of the study have changed. And they've changed with the age of the participants and the interest in society at that time. So initially, it was about birth rate. Why was that dropping? And what about obstetrical? in um, midwifery services in that country. Then later on, they became very interested in the influence of inequities in society, like people from rich families. Did they do better in school compared to you know, children from poorer families? And why would that be? So they studied that. And then they also became very interested in education, the influence of education on children and their success in life when they went into the workforce. But since 1977, they've focused on aging, uh, the person's ability to remain independent and look after themselves, what we call self-care, and also how receptive they are to um, health promotion and embracing healthy lifestyles. So the whole study has morphed and changed over time to address different questions uh, that arose within that society over that long period of time. Now, we definitely hope that the Canadian Longitudinal Study in Aging will be useful for Canadians now and Canadians in the future, and it will address major policy issues um, as well as individual questions people have about how to promote their own health. So that's really the thinking behind the CLSA. Now, some of you have probably already visited the website. That's the web address if, if you do use the internet. Uh, and you can get a lot of information about the study there. The, the study, the CLSA, is what's called a strategic initiative of the CIHR. That means that the Canadian Institute of Health Research, that's what CIHR stands for, realized that this was an important investment in research, and it was different than other investments they have made in research uh, as it relates to health and health care. And the intent is to be a national, long-term study that would follow approximately 50,000 men and women, 45 to 85 at the time of enrollment, for 20 or more years. So that's kind of the, the intent. Um, a friend of mine who's 85 said he wanted to get into the study because he'd like to live to be 105. <laughs> but it sort of doesn't work that way. But the information would be collected on the evolution over time of these individuals' biological, physical, psychological, social, and lifestyle characteristics. And that was going to be done in order to better understand how individually and in combination these factors impact on the person's health, their maintenance of health, and the development of diseases and disability as they grow older. That's really the overall intent of the study. Now there are two components of the study of the 50,000. They're what we call the tracking and then the comprehensive group or Cohort is another term we used. Uh, cohort just means group. So the, the tracking group uh, is approximately 20,000 individuals, and their data is collected through uh, computer-assisted telephone interviews. 
there's a person who calls and asks the questions, but they have a computer screen that helps them in asking the questions at the appropriate time and in the appropriate order. So that's what computer-assisted telephone interviews means. The other 30,000 are part of the comprehensive group, and, and most of you, I think all of you would be in a comprehensive group, approximately 30,000, and they go, undergo an in-home interview, and then they visit the CLSA data collection site, and you visited the CLA site here in Calgary in the TRW building. And at that visit, additional data, including physical assessments like how quickly you might walk or how well you can um, you know, uh, grip uh, and your hand grip strength and how well you might see or hear are collected. And then samples like blood samples and urine samples are collected. Now, those who are in the tracking component or group can be from anywhere within the 10 Canadian provinces. While those recruited in the comprehensive have to live within 25 to 50 kilometers radius of their local DCS. So they have to be, for example, in Calgary, you have to be around Calgary. Of course, Calgary is very, western city is very different than eastern city. So when we say within 25, 50 kilometers of Calgary, that basically means it's Calgary. Uh, <laughs> You know, in eastern city, they have these communities all around the city, so it can get quite, quite a bit more complicated. So these are the three uh, lead investigators, or called principal investigators, in the CLSA. Uh, the person in the mid middle is Dr. Praminder Rani, who's at Master. Uh, Dr. Christina, she goes by Tina Wilson, um, is on your left, and Dr. Susan Kirkland um, is on your right. She's from Dalhousie, and Tina's from McGill. Um, now, in addition to these three principal investigators, there are 11 local site principal investigators, and, and I happen to be one. I happen to be the one for Calgary. There are eight working groups. These are researchers across the country who uh, collect and, and deal with a particular topic or issue in the CLSA. Um, I also lead a, one of the working groups. It's called the clinical working group. So we would review the questions that would be asked that relates to you know, what conditions you might have or what your general health is like. There's other groups, for example, one on psychology, another one on lifestyle. And they also are researchers from around the country who meet on a regular basis to discuss the study, what uh, information is being collected and how well that information is being collected. Now, there are over 160 researchers across the country in 26 post-secondary institutions who are uh, researchers within CLSA. And there are over 120 operational staff across the country. So you can see it's, it's, it's getting to be quite a large enterprise. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the target was 50,000, and uh, a total of 51,352 people were enrolled into the, the study uh, for the initial evaluation, the baseline evaluation. So uh, we um, uh, more than achieved our goal. Now, there's also a lot of structures around the country. There are 11 data collection sites, um, and I've listed them here. Um, and you can see Calgary and Winnipeg are the ones in the prairies. Um, there are uh, three in uh, British Columbia. You can see that there's two in Vancouver. Uh, it's because people thought it's too difficult to drive across to Vancouver to go to one site. So they got two sites, one at the University of uh, British Columbia and one at Simon Fraser University. Um, and then you can see the other sites. There is a national coordinating center um, in McMaster, and there's also a center where all the specimens, the so blood specimens and urine specimens, are, are frozen and stored, and also some of them are analyzed. Though I should mention a lot of the blood analysis will be done here in Calgary uh, through Calgary Lab Services. Um, there is a, a center at McGill where all that data is being uh, stored, uh, and people would make requests to that center for access to that data, and we'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. And then there's a genetics and epigenetics center at the University of British Columbia, which is planned but not in operation yet. And then there are four computer-assisted telephone interview centers across the country. So that's the infrastructure uh, for the study. Um, these are the staff in the Calgary site. I don't know if any of them are in the room or they're all working really hard, but uh, I've listed them all here alphabetically. No, no favoritism shown here at all. Um, and most are here tonight helping with the event. Now, 
Um, the data that's been collected on the CLSA is now becoming available. And you could visit a website, I put it up here at the top line, and, in, and it's called the Data Preview Site, and you can see overall what type of information is being collected, what questions are being asked, and how people might um, uh, apply for access to that information and possibly the biological samples down the road. Uh, not everything is available at the present time, and, but it is being uh, made available to uh, Canadian and international public sector researchers. Um, and no preference has been given to anyone. Anyone has a good idea or a thought about how this data should be used or it would be encouraged to apply. Uh, there is a review process. Uh, people have to meet certain conditions. Um, and then they're provided um, um, that information that they requested if they passed mustard. Now, if you're interested to better understand about how people might apply for the data, you can navigate around that site. You can find information. And a good place to start is what they call the Frequently Asked Questions section, the Facts section. And that's a useful place to get a start. So, as I mentioned, the data is now available. And more and more is becoming available as time goes on. So the questionnaire data from the more than 51,000 participants is available. And the um, comprehensive fiscal assessment and uh, some of the blood work, hemological biomarkers are now available from the more than 30,000 participants who visited a uh, data collection site or DCS across the country. Um, so data will be released to researchers uh, who, who submit and uh, the submission would be reviewed. And if it meets all the conditions uh, after review of their application, they would be provided the data. Um, they are charged typically $3,000 in that fees just to cover the cost of preparing the data and making it available to them. And they have certain conditions, for example, on confidentiality and how they're going to use the data. And they have to only limit their use to that particular question they wanted to answer. Now, to give you an idea of some of the data, and, and you have a data portal, you can go and you can take a look at the answers to a lot of these questions. I just picked the one dealing with sleep. Because I'm sure everyone here has great sleep. No sleeping problems at all. I, I, and I thought it just sort of interesting to look at it. So there are eight questions dealing with sleep at the initial evaluation, the baseline evaluation. And it dealt with overall sleep satisfaction, sleep duration, uh, whether people had trouble getting to sleep, that's called sleep onset insomnia. Or if they had trouble staying asleep, that's called sleep maintenance insomnia. Were they sleepy the next day because they weren't sleeping well? Uh, and then they have some sleep problems, called one called restless leg syndromes. That's sort of an irritating feeling that your legs can't stay still. You have to move them. And if you walk, that sometimes will relieve that discomfort. And another sleep condition called REM sleep behavior disorder. So REM sleep, well, REM is our dream sleep. And normally when we dream, we have REM sleep, we don't move. We're paralyzed. People with a REM sleep behavior disorder can move while they're having their dream and will act out a dream and often will thrash around and uh, uh, be quite active um, and may, in fact, uh, be so active they drive away their sleep partner. Um, and there was an interest about how common that might be in the Canadian uh, population overall, the aging Canadian population. In brackets, I put you where the various questions come from. Uh, they come from various questionnaires or tools which have been developed to look at sleep. And throughout the CLSA, you'll find that where certain questions and certain groups of questions have been taken or selected from other questionnaires which have been validated or proven to be useful in other studies. So that's the source where all the problems came from. So before we look at the data, um, maybe just think about what, what proportion of people in the CLSA, the 30,000 who did the comprehensive, said they were unhappy or very unhappy with their sleep. Just think about what figure that might be. Think about uh, how long they slept on average. I'm sure your mother told you sleep eight hours, right? Or nine hours. Um, and then how often people had these other problems. And I'll show you some of the data. And this is just the overall response. It's not broken down by sex or age. You can see that nearly a quarter said they were dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their sleep. So 25%, which is pretty high when you think of it. Um, the average amount of sleep was 6.8 hours which is a lot less than your mom told you to sleep. Uh, and SD stands for standard deviation. That's sort of the spread. 
So most people slept between 5.5 hours and um, 8.1 hours. Over the past month, how often did it take you more than 30 minutes to fall asleep? You can see that uh, over 15% said that happened three or more times every week, so which is quite a bit. Over the last month, how often did you wake in the middle of the night um, or too early in the morning and found it difficult to fall asleep again? You can see it again. If you count how many people said yes three or more times a week, it was close to 14%. Over the last month, how often um, do you find it difficult to stay awake during your normal waking hours when you want to? And near 9% said that. And um, now, on these other questions, there are a number of follow-up questions. If you answered yes, or you had a certain frequency of problem, then there'll be follow-up questions about how long you've had this problem. Does it interfere with your daily functioning? Um, and, um, and, and that would be for the questions about he had trouble falling asleep, or, or waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to get back to sleep, or staying awake uh, the next day. Then the question, how, uh, have you ever been told or suspect yourself that you seem to act out your dreams while asleep? You can see nearly uh, one in 10 said that. Uh, do you have or have you sometimes experienced recurrent uncomfortable feelings or sensations in your legs while sitting or lying down? And another question, do you have or have you sometimes experienced recurrent need to urge to move your legs while sitting or lying down? You can see nearly a third answered yes to either question. And then there were follow-up questions to ask about that. Now, one, one question you didn't see there was snoring. My, my wife would say you should ask that question. But it wasn't asked in the, in the initial uh, evaluation, but it was added to the first follow-up. Some of you might recall being asked that question. And the question is, well, do you snore loudly? And that was defined as uh, more than talking level, or could be heard through a closed door. Um, or does someone notice that you stop breathing while you're asleep? And we'll see how many people respond yes to those questions. Um, because, you know, we do spend a third of our life asleep, and it's sort of an interesting issue about how well we're sleeping, the effect of sleep and sleep problems on what happens to us in the other 16 hours a day. Now, if you visit a website and that page right there, you can see all the studies which are now being done using the CLSA data. You, you might kind of feel, well, we've done this, but is anyone using the data? And the answer is yes. And it's increasing year after year after year. So approved projects, in 2013, there was only one. In 2014, there was uh, three. In 2015, it went up to 17. In 2016, there are now 40 new studies which were started um, using CLSA data. And so far this year, up to the end of April, there were six, and we anticipate that there'll be about the same number, if not more, than seen in 2016. Now, um, I, uh, the analysis is going to be done by current but also future researchers. And we have uh, at least one future researcher, Ann Tui, back there. Ann, just wave. So Anne, Anne was one of the, the early ones. I believe you got approval in 2014. And Anne's interested in looking at the benefits and challenges of pet ownership as we age. And if the question period later on, if you have any questions directed to Anne about that particular issue, she'd be happy to answer them. Um, there was another young researcher who was going to try to make it, but I don't know if she was able to make it. Uh, that's uh, Neera. I don't think she's here. Oh, there you are. Please stand up. And she's visiting us from Oxford. And she's come here to use CLSA data to look at the relationship between mobility and walking in particular and thinking as we age. Because it's found there's this interesting link between our ability to walk and how well we walk with our, our thinking abilities. And um, this shows the international interest in the study, coming all the way from Oxford. Um, where in England they have all these longitudinal studies, but here we have a very good longitudinal study with very interesting data that uh, researchers from around the world would be interested in. So I'd like to thank Anne and Nairari for their work and their interest in the study and for your contributions. Because I'm getting older every day. 
So let's move on and just talk a bit about promoting healthy aging. And uh, the first thing I was asked uh, to talk a bit about was brain and thinking. And I, I'm going to give you sort of some general points. I'm happy to get into more specifics later on. But even when we talk about more specifics, it's still going to have to be fairly general because I want to know all the details, which might be important to really answer your particular question because as uh, Margaret Atwood said, context is all. You know, there's so many details you have to know about a person in a situation to really be able to give informed opinion or advice. But let's talk a bit about brain and thinking um, as we get older. First off, I can reassure you that we all forget things. There was, there was a study done in Iceland where they looked at people uh, at university in Iceland and they asked them to go around with a diary and keep track of every time they forgot something. And uh, on average, they forgot at least once a day. And the more busy you are, the more stressed you are, the more tired you are, the more likely you are to forget. So we all have slippages now and then. And every time you forget something doesn't mean you're developing an Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So please be reassured about that. Now with normal aging, some things do get better with our thinking. In general, for example, our wisdom tends to get better and our vocabulary tends to get better. Um, and we could probably tell more interesting stories than when we were younger. But typically, there is a mild decline in memory as we get older. And the type of memory problem we have when we get older is a problem with retrieval. The memory is there, but we just can't pull it out really quick. Um, we often will get it when we get a hint or a cue. Um, and we often have that tip of the tongue phenomenon. We know it's there, but it just doesn't come out until it's too late. And that's normal with aging. Now, some people have no changes with memory as they get older, but in general, all of us will encounter some of these aggravations. Another problem that tends to happen with most people, but not everyone, is we, we have a little bit more trouble with attention. We have more trouble focusing our attention. We're a little bit more distractible. When I was um, younger in university, and uh, and, and where I lived, if there was a party going on, I could still study. Because I never went to parties, I just studied. Um, but I could focus my, my attention. But now if I go in the library, if someone is whispering uh, two miles away, it bothers me. You know, and I have less ability to ignore it and just focus my attention on the task at hand. We also tend not to be as fast, and we tend to have more challenges with tasks that require taking in a lot of information and analyzing it in a new way. But again, there's a lot of variability. And with normal aging, the changes which may occur, we can compensate for those changes. And we can work around them. Now, what's of more concern is when these problems get um, more severe and starting having an impact on our lives. And we've all heard the term dementia. But there's now a, another uh, condition you hear more and more about called mild cognitive impairment. Now, mild cognitive impairment is that sort of boundary between normality and a dementia. So someone with mild cognitive impairment still is independent, still has you know, good general thinking. But if you test them, they definitely do worse on certain aspects of thinking, worse than you'd expect because of their age or their sex or their education. They definitely have a problem. And they feel often they have a problem. And those who know and love that person feel, yeah, there's been a change. You know, not quite as good as they, they were, still independent. Now, mild cognitive impairment, many people stay the same. Some people get better. But some people do get worse. And it's a, it's a, it's a state of increased risk of progression to more serious problems, what we call a dementia. Um, so dementia. That means you have an acquired problem with thinking. That means you are doing better at one time, but there's been a change and there's been a decline. If, unfortunately, you had a developmental handicap and there's been no change, you've always had that degree of difficulty, that would not be a dementia. Dementia means there's been a change. And that thinking problem usually includes memory, but usually some other aspect of thinking, like decision making or language with your speech. And these problems are severe enough to interfere with your ability to live independently. And it can't be better explained by something else like a depression 
or an acute confusion or what we call a delirium. We've all had deliriums. When we think back when you were a child and you had a high fever and you had that sort of dreamlike state, you weren't quite sure what was real, what wasn't real, whether you're awake or not. That's sort of like a delirium. And that's related to an, usually an acute problem. And once that acute problem is dealt with or passes, you, you would recover and return by and large to your prior abilities. So there are many potential causes of dementia. The most common cause in our society would be Alzheimer's disease. Now the aging of Canadian society is expected to lead to a large increase in the number of people with dementia. So last year, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada estimated that there were about uh, 564,000 persons in Canada living with dementia. In 2031, purely because of the aging of our society, that number is expected to increase to a little bit less than 1 million, 937,000 a Calgary, essentially. Uh, and that will have a major impact on them themselves, but also on their families and also on the health and social services uh, of our country. But um, there is good news. Uh, there is um, studies which have shown that in high income countries like Canada, the risk of dementia at specific ages may have declined over the last quarter of a century, over the last 25 years. And I'll give you one example. This was a study published earlier this year from the United States. So it's a national American study that compared the risk of having dementia in people 65 and over in the year 2000 and in the year 2012. So in 2000, 11.6% of everyone 65 and over had a dementia. And in 2012, um, that had declined to 8.8%. So that's a 24% drop. Now, of course, the, the $100 million question is why? And uh, people have looked at it, and it could be partially accounted by education. And I'll just digress here. It's been known for a long time that more highly educated people are less likely to develop dementia. And that's felt to be possibly because education stimulates your mind and kind of exercises the brain, much as like we exercise a muscle when we run or lift weights. Uh, and that we have more reserve, and we're able to tolerate more problems as we get older. And in the States, between 2000 and 2012, the average number of years of education went up in 12 years by one year. So let's say in 2000, the average number of years would be 10 years, it was 11 years uh, in 2012. And that was felt to account for some of it. Um, another uh, part of it might be explained by better treatment of uh, cardiovascular diseases. I'm thinking here like hypertension and diabetes and high cholesterol levels, um, and, and we're picking up on those things better, and these conditions are risk factors for developing thinking problems as we get older. So it might be partly accounted for that, but to be honest, we don't fully understand what's going on. But it's good news. And we like to kind of leverage on that. And the thinking now um, is that if we could address uh, use of tobacco, uh, poor diet, physical inactivity, uh, raised high uh, blood pressure, or raised blood pressure, I should say, elevated cholesterol, obesity, and diabetes, we could reduce the likelihood of dementia. And the guess is that we might be reduced, might be able to reduce the numbers by 20% over the next 20 years, which is nothing to, to you know, sneeze at. Well, of course, we like it to be 100%, but it's a good start. And particularly if we have a better understanding of what's going on, we hopefully can make that 20% higher, a higher rate of reduction. It's also felt that we could add to that figure by maximizing protective factors, we know that, remember I talked about years of education, if we have more cognitive enrichment, that might be good for us. If we have more stimulation of our, of our minds over our lives, that would be good. If we're more socially engaged, we're more involved in groups, we come out to talks like this tonight, if we sleep better. And if we could uh, minimize risky behaviors like traumatic brain injuries, like hockey players and football players, um, and excessive alcohol intake and substance abuse. And also deal with mental health issues like decreased likelihood of depression or depressive symptoms or excessive stress or what we call neuroticism, neuroticism which is a tendency to respond in a, with negative emotions when we get frustrated or lost. Some people, when something bad happens to them, they keep on going. It doesn't bother them. It's you know, water off the back of a duck. And some people cannot tolerate any type of frustration and they just 
drives them wild. But if you could sort of just let it go and keep moving on, that would probably be a better way for you um, and less likely to lead to problems down the road. So if we could do all those things, we might even be able to improve it even a bit more, even now with our imperfect understanding. Now, I was also asked to talk a bit about um, lifestyles and practices and attitudes and an impact on aging and healthy aging. I, I, there, there's a lot of information that keeping active and engaged mentally, physically, and socially is good for us as we get older. Um, the worst thing to do when you retire is to go home and watch TV, and that's all you do. You have to stay part of your community, part of your social network, part of your family, and keep active and engaged. Um, keeping mentally active by reading, um, going to galleries, going to concerts, uh, going to talks, uh, is all good, um, and being physically active, you know, exercising. And, and um, for example, when we go to the mall, maybe not park close to the mall, but far away in the parking lot and walk in would be better for us. We should make our lives a little bit harder in some ways. And then if we have a better diet, if we have a heart healthy diet, because it appears that a diet which is uh, good for our heart is also good for our brain and other aspects of our health. And there's a lot of interest right now in a Mediterranean diet, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And then attitude. All of us have to have meaning and have to have joy in our lives. Um, and if we have a positive attitude towards aging, there's increasing evidence that that is good for us as we get older, and we're less likely to show declines or decrements uh, as we get older. There's a quote from Betty Friedan that I like, is aging is not lost youth, but a new stage of opportunity and strength. We can't look backwards, we must look forward. So physical activity, what's recommended? Um, the um, uh, Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology um, gives the same recommendations for adults 18 to 64 as for adults 65 and over. And they recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity per week. So they define moderate, it would be akin to a brisk walk and uh, vigorous would be jogging. And the bouts of that activity should be at least 10 minutes. That's what they recommend. They also uh, would suggest that it would be beneficial to add muscle or bone strengthening activities using our larger muscles. Um, and they also feel that more physical activity would provide greater health benefits. That if you do 150 minutes and you enjoy it and it's not a, a burden for you, and you could fit it into your lives, maybe 180 minutes would be even better. So that's what they suggest. Now, for diet, Mediterranean diet is this. It's primarily plant-based, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and nuts, that you use olive oil rather than butter, and you use herbs and spices rather than salt to flavor your food. Uh, you limit red meat to no more than a few times a month and fish and poultry at least twice a week. And sort of the, the one that's a bit argued about is red wine in moderation. So, you know, if, if you are a responsible consumer of alcohol, this would be one more reason to carry on with that pleasure in your life. But you'd never recommend people start drinking for their health because it's too slippery a slope. <laughs> now, the other question is, is what's moderate, right? I mean, most doctors define moderate as what I drink. <laughs> and heavy drinking would be anything more than that. But, but really, uh, moderate alcohol intake would be no more than three to four standard drinks per session, and no more than nine drinks per week for women, and 12 to 14 for men. So you could sort of, I'm, I'm not asking to vote or anything, but just keep in mind, you'd, you'd want to be moderate or less. And, and also, what's moderate varies from country to country. Like, what's moderate in Canada might be very different than you'd see in France. Um, there, there is limited data, not conclusive, but, but encouraging data that there are benefits in preventing chronic conditions if you follow a Mediterranean diet or a diet much like that. Now, also, you, uh, there are lessons we can learn from um, our um, other longitudinal studies. There is a longitudinal study being done in Ireland called TILDA. Now, I hate these acronyms where they take letters from the middle of words to make a something. 
And that's what they did here. So tilde is taken from the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. You can see I bolded the letters they took. And why they picked those particular letters and middle words, I, I have no idea. And as far as I can tell, tilde doesn't mean anything in Gaelic. You know, I, I did look it up. So what they found was that independent of changes in people's health, like, you know, having a stroke or, God forbid, a, a bone fracture um, or the onset of depression, negative perceptions of how you look at aging, if you have look, look at aging in a negative way, and your expectations of what the future will be like as you get older, your sense of control uh, of yourself as you get older, and you're just sort of core uh, response, emotional response to aging. If you were more negative in the way you looked at growing older, that predicted declines over the next couple of years in your self-esteem, your satisfaction with life, and your self-rated health. It also was uh, likely to be associated with worse health behaviors. You're less likely to exercise. You're less likely to follow a healthy diet. You're less likely to have a consistent visits to a, a health care practitioner. You spent less time in leisure activities, and you're less engaged in your community. And that led to hard changes in people's thinking. They did worse on thinking tests, much like the ones you did in the CLSA, and did worse on tests of physical functioning. You know, for example, grip strength or walking speed. So how you think about aging, how you think about yourself, does have an influence on what actually does happen to you as you get older. Um, and the last I was asked to talk a bit about living well with chronic conditions. And of course, each chronic condition is a bit different, but I'm just going to talk about things in general. And if there's time, we could talk about specific questions about specific problems, if you wish. So over time in our country, if we compare 2017 with uh, 1917 or 1817, there's been a change in the types of health problems we encounter. And there's also been a change in people as they age and the type of health problems they encounter. At earlier times in our country and at earlier ages for us, we tend to be bedeviled mainly by acute conditions and injuries. The main health problems would be things like broken bones or getting an infection like a pneumonia. But as we get older, but also as Canada has gotten older, we're moving to a time where the major health issues are chronic conditions and chronic diseases. Now, we do have to change the way we respond to that. Because to deal with acute conditions and injuries, you have a healthcare system and you have a healthcare habits which tend to be reactive and you have episodic care. So you only see a healthcare practitioner when you develop an acute problem and you just deal with that acute problem for that short period of time, then it's gone, and then you forget about it and you move on. You have to change from that way of dealing with healthcare um, to a more proactive um, way of looking at health and also relying more on ongoing care because these are problems which will not disappear. And we have to think more about health promotion and disease prevention. And in the new healthcare system that we're painfully moving towards, there's going to have to be greater collaboration between the person with the condition. They have to be informed, they have to be engaged, and they have to have the knowledge and skills they need to deal with their health conditions and the tools they require to help manage that condition. And you have to have that allied with healthcare services which are proactive and look for problems at an earlier stage rather than responding to when they become more severe. That's also provided in a coordinated and integrated fashion and provided mainly in the community, not in the hospital. Because the hospitals um, has to be there. We need hospitals. I'm not saying close hospitals. But, but we like to nip problems in the bud before they progress to the point where hospitalization becomes the, the best option for them. And that's what we're moving towards as time goes on. Now, we have time for the questions. And I think uh, we have our uh, staff with the uh, microphones. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to answer. There's one way over here. Have you had any significant surprises so far in the data you've collected? Um, you know, it's, it's so early in the, in, in the stage of analysis of the data. Um, I, I, I mean, one thing I found, and I think every time you look at the data, sometimes you, you'll find surprising things. I, I show you some of the data from sleep. I was just interested in sleep, and 
I, I was a bit surprised. Um, I was surprised how many people are not happy with their sleep and seem to be sleeping relatively short periods of time. Um, you often hear that, that we're all sleep deprived and this seems to kind of feed into it a bit. Um, now really the big question is like, when you look at that group, you want to split it out those who are satisfied and sleeping well and those who are not and how they differ and, and is there any way to shift the satisfied group into the satisfied group? That's, that's really the follow-up questions which are going to be really very important to answer. The people who developed that module, that section of the, of the uh, CLSA, uh, they're analyzing the data right now. And also with a longitudinal study, it's really going to be interesting to know if you're dissatisfied with your sleep in 2015, what's, what's it like in 2018? You know, has it gotten better or worse, stayed about the same? Um, and so that's going to be a really interesting question to look at as well. So um, any, anything that's um, earth shattering, um, totally beyond the realms, I, I can't say that, but it's still early in the analysis bit. But I, I think every time you look at the data, you sort of see interesting things. You say, well, why is that? And you wonder about that. Okay. In yes, back here, I think, first. In your tilde, yep. uh, you have mental state impacting physical abilities or behavior. Yes. How do you know this is not a chicken and egg type question okay. where in some cases mental affects physical, but physical may be driving the mental? Okay, so, so the question is, I, I was, uh, you, I'll try to. Maybe you repeat it to me, then I'll repeat it. Okay. Is it, is it chicken and egg? Yes. Because mental could impact physical? Yes. Mental could impact physical, or physical can impact mental, which you then correlate. So you've got okay. a correlation, but not necessarily okay. causation. Yeah, the only thing about the tildes data that I showed you was that they looked at time one, and then they came back and looked at time two, and they looked at change. So the people who had the negative attitudes about aging, they're the ones who showed a more definite decline in their functional abilities, even when they try to factor in all other potential explanations. So it was not a cross-sectional study where, where you looked at everyone at the same time. This was predictive. If you had negative attitudes about aging, it predicted worse health, even if you try to account for everything else. But you know, that's a very good, important question. And whenever you see correlation, that doesn't prove causation. And, and you have to look harder. Yeah. Are, are you looking at what role genetics plays in aging? Yes, definitely. Uh, and um, that's, for example, the blood samples. That's going to be a genetic analysis to look at what correlates with um, more um, personally meaningful and successful aging as we grow older. I, I think uh, for, for us as we grow older, what kind of predicts that is, is our genes I think are important. I also think what we do and what we've been exposed to is important. I also think time's going to be important. And, and also I think luck and chance. You know, things happen to people even if you do everything right or everything wrong that would be somewhat unexpected. Um, I don't think there's going to be a gene, one gene that explains everything. But I think it's all going to be part of this kind of uh, complex equation that will lead to better or not so uh, successful aging. And clearly, you'd like to be able to find out if there's sort of a genetic predisposition, is there anything you could do about that? Is there some way to uh, confound that deficit or you know, fill in the gap so that you're less likely to show uh, the consequences of that maybe not as desirable genetic makeup? But you know, our genes are funny things, and, and some genes will lead to problems, but some genes lead to great successes for us, and our genes are us, you know? And also, uh, what genes are turned on or turned off are also influenced by things in the environment. Um, in the, um, in, in the, um, the 1946 study that I mentioned, um, they found, for example, that your birth weight predicted your grip strength when you're 50 years old. Um, so what happens to us in very early in life sometimes sort of sets in train things that, that are, can sometimes be very difficult to intervene and change. Um, but of course, in, in Canada, we're impatient and we're not going to do a 70-year study to answer that question. And we obviously want the answers now. 
and we, and we want answers now, particularly for ourselves, but also uh, even more so for our children. Okay. Just wanted to ask, yeah. uh, did you say that we would ha be able to get access to our own personal data? Um, no, it's, it's, it's all anonymized. Um, Is it possible to get that? No, no. But, okay. but remember no, when just because there was a lot of tests that were done, and yes. I was, I've been to, in conversation with my doctor about yes. doing different things, and yeah. so we, we won't be able to get that. So, so no, uh, not, uh, you do get at the end of your visit to DCS, you do get that sheet that gives you some information about okay. your evaluation. Now, okay. one thing you got in the baseline you haven't got in the follow-up was your, your DEXA, you know, your bone density, but you'll be getting something that's better than a DEXA, score is called a FRAX, that's a fracture risk assessment. And it looks at the DEXA, but it also looks at other factors which help predict whether you're gonna have a fracture or not. And you'll be told whether you're at high, mid, or low risk for fractures. Just and that could be shared with your doctor. Just one more question. Yep. Um, I've been on sleeping medication for going on 30 years. Yep. Is, that, is that information being captured in with the people that are having sleep problems? Yes, okay. yes. Yes, it is. And by the way, um, there, there are some specifics I can't get into, but if you have any kind of specific question, if you send it uh, to the CLSA email address, you know, on the first slide, I'll do my best to respond to you or maybe get in touch with you to ask what a specific question you might have. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm not yep. sure. I was wondering if you were capturing any um, data on menopause for women? Yes. Um, relative to sleeping and maybe yes. other uh, health issues? Yes. There, there's a whole section on women's health. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe there's an equivalent section on men's health. So what, we have to work on that. But yes. <coughs> Has the effect of stress been factored in? I'm looking at right now at the amount of stress that's taking place on the East Coast with the um, floods, etc. Yes. And once upon a time, they used to say that stress could turn your hair white. Well, I'm looking around this room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, has that been factored in in any way, shape, or form as to the effect on aging? Yes, and, and you know, on the data being collected, there are questions about stress, there are going to be more questions being asked in the future about anxiety. And some of the blood tests could also look for markers of stress within people's blood. Uh, so that definitely will be looked at. The other thing that would be kind of interesting um, in the future is we hope to be able to link the data being collected in these, you know, urban sites across the country to with the environmental information. You know, we'll be able to compare it, for example, average temperatures or uh, climate change, uh, um, storms. Um, you talk about stress, think of 2013, eh? But this time, you know, and the flooding here. Or what happened in Fort McMurray last year. Um, and and I, I think we, have, we, we kind of have to um, look at other data sources that might give us a bit more information uh, uh, and um, add to the data being collected from all of you when you come in. Um, and, and because it's across the country, we could look, we could compare various countries and various parts of the country and whether there are changes. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was another large Canadian study called the Canadian Study of Health and Aging. And they looked at how people defined successful or healthy aging in different parts of the country, and there are differences. People in Quebec defined it differently than people in the West, for example. So that's an interesting, why is that, you know? Uh, and what's important in Eastern Canada as compared to Western Canada. All those things will have to be looked at. Um, Anne and myself were part of a group that uh, will be looking at CLSA data in eight urban communities across the country that have different policies for being age friendly. And we're trying to evaluate the impact of age friendliness of a community on how people perceive their aging. And it might be interesting to follow that group over time. Yep. Uh, there, there seems uh, that there could be a, a bias to, uh, uh, in the comprehensive study towards urban Canadians versus rural. How are you managing that okay. potential bias? Well, it, it's recognized and it's going to be um, 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 always kept in mind when the data is being analyzed. 
but the CLSA, no matter how big it is, can't answer all research questions. And there might well have to be something done separately for Canadians living in rural and remote areas. It also will answer very little about Indigenous populations. I mean, you know, Indigenous people who live in urban areas can be part of the study, but if they live on reserves in remote areas, they will not be part of the study. Um, so that's, that is a hole in the study, and that's recognized. Um, I'm part of a, of a group of Indigenous researchers who will be looking at the CLSA data to see how much information it, we're collecting could be used by them and, and, and uh, what holes they are and where, how we could best fill those gaps. Okay. Dr. Hogan, yes. I was wondering if you could tell me, I, all, of this, all of this data collection is so impressive. Um, are any of our governments our government representatives um, seeing this data? Are they able to plan our health care better in the future? Like, what's going to be used with this? Well, you know, um, it's, it's still very early in the evolution of the CLSA. I can't say it's had an impact on uh, public policy yet in Canada. Uh, but I know the uh, 1946 birth cohort study did impact what thing, how things were done in the United Kingdom. You know, it did have an influence on education. It did have an influence on trying to deal with social inequities at birth. Um, and I, th I think as time goes on, and to be honest with you, I think it might take maybe two, three cycles before, you know, the, um, the data from the CLSA, the information from the CLSA, really becomes uh, powerful and so unique that it should influence uh, public policy, national policy. Uh, you know, definitely um, we do our best to inform politicians at all three levels about the study and how it could possibly be used um, to inform public policy. Um, and for example, uh, we are working with colleagues in the city of Calgary to look at CLSA data and whether that is a useful source of data for them when they look at public policy as it relates to an aging um, Calgary population. And uh, that's something we're working with uh, quite closely with them. Yes. My song? Yep. My partner and I have been uh, square dancing for over 25 years. Yep. As I look around, uh, the majority of the people here should be dancing with us. Yes. Anyways, there have been many medical, uh, much medical documentation mm -hmm. to support this activity. I I'm just a little bit surprised that it hasn't sunk in a little better because it when they, when they do these articles, they do emphasize the importance of being able to dance and, and listen to a cure at the same time. And they do compare it with uh, all kinds of card games. And they said there's, there's no card game, bridge, crib, or any other card game that has the same ability to minimize the uh, progress towards Alzheimer's uh, than square and round dancing because of the fact you have to be able to listen and carry out the activity at the same time. So we'd like a little more promotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, now, fr from the medical society or yeah. from anybody, because it, it's really uh, a wonderful activity, social and otherwise. Yeah, no, it is. I, I think dancing is a very interesting form of activity because it's, um, it, it's good from a physical standpoint, but from a mental standpoint as well, and also a social standpoint. And it sort of hits all the boxes. Um, the, um, but you can imagine the difficulty of proving that in, in studies, you know, because it's, it's hard to um, randomly allocate dancing because people choose to dance or not to dance. And um, that might be an important influence on, on good outcomes. Uh, yeah. 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 Personally, I just do break dancing. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I, I'm not arguing with all. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wondered if the uh, information being gathered is sufficient to drill down in, in certain ways. Uh, I'm thinking uh, certainly the physical, mental, social we're talking about. And uh, my real question is the interaction with small children and uh, like grandchildren and great-grandchildren with, uh, yeah. with aging people. And if there would be enough information gathered to be able to say, you know what, we need to get more formalized 
connection between elementary schools and elderly homes nearby and stuff, which, you know, to create that kind of interaction, which is positive, positive uh, uh, mentally and, and physically and everything else. To, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. They, the, one of the problems with a study like CLSA, and you've gone through it, and you know, a lot of data has been collected, but someone can always say, well, why don't you ask this? You know, why don't you add this question? And we're going through um, preparations for the next follow-up phase right now. So we, at the start of it, we say, well, let's go through and let's see what questions we could drop. You know, and you go through 10,000 pages of document and you might find two questions. You say, yeah, we could drop those. But there's about 10,000 more questions people want to add. And, and it's, it's really hard to keep it under control. Uh, I think the point you make is a good one because uh, we are collecting a lot of very useful information. But sometimes it's not quite as deep as we would want. You know, in the TILDA study that I talked about, you know, they asked this questionnaire about people's perception of aging. Well, we, we haven't done that. And that would be an interesting question. And you kind of say, well, why didn't we do that? Wouldn't, shouldn't we do that? Well, if we add something, then we really should be taking something out. And what do you take out? And it, it becomes a very, very difficult exercise. I, but I agree with you entirely. I think also I agree that with this idea that we should be part of a multi-generational community. I don't think it's good for us to live in age-restricted silos, you know, for any of us at any age. I mean, that's my opinion. Yes. You have the microphone? Not yet. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you just... I can project. Well, if you do, I'll, I'll have to... I'll have to uh, do, how do you want to do it, Birchman? Can we let this lady go first and then we'll run it over? Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm interested in the um, incentives. Okay. I'm interested in the incentives that are inherent in funding models, yep. and the funding model we have now that was developed when Medicare was instituted, uh, largely focused on acute care, and excluded psychiatric care. If my recollection is correct, do you anticipate, as this um, <clears throat> as this study goes along? that the funding model might change uh, to uh, reward, um, um, <clears throat> might change to reward care for um, ongoing chronic health problems. So the question is, is the influence of the funding model for health care? And, and when Medicare came in, we were dealing, as I mentioned before, mainly in a society where acute health problems were the big issue. And in fact, you know, when I looked at the, at the Hall Commission, they said that um, they were going to provide health care for everyone at a certain level, but they were going to restrict uh, any enhanced care for older people or for people with mental health issues until the general population was well dealt with, which is the opposite of what happened in the United States, right, where they targeted the money they spent on health care to older Americans. So we sort of did the flip. I, I do think um, that we are trying to shift, but it's really hard to move money from acute care hospitals into the community-based services where, where I think it should be spent, because that means you might have to close a hospital. And, and when you look at the newspaper, you read the Herald, I mean, when there's a health care crisis, it's usually about backups in emergency room or not enough hospital beds. And, and, and you know, I, I know politicians have their failings, but, but you can see the problems they face. You know, if they say, well, we want to shift money, you know, from, the, let's say, hospital system into a community-based system, um, they get a lot of pushback when they try to do that. And sometimes it all comes from the general public. Sometimes it comes from the healthcare practitioners, including physicians. Um, and, and sometimes, to really end up saving money in the community, you have to make an initial investment up front. And, and, and the money is so tight, it's hard to find that extra money to set up the services the way you want. I think all we can do is fight the good fight and, and you know, make the case over and over and over again. Because clearly that's the way we should be going. Um, the CLSA probably will not talk directly to that particular issue because it's not going to cover all research questions we have in this country. But it's a great question, and it's a really important point. Oh, sorry. I think this gentleman here, we have to bring the 
Oh, got it? Okay. You bet. Thank you. Now, this is a very selfish question yes. I'm going to ask. Okay. I respect the fact that you have a lot of data yeah. and that you're doing a... And you're doing a lot of research, but how does that affect me? Yeah. Now, uh, there is another thing. Somebody should write a book on what to expect as you grow older. Yeah. Be because when I passed 81, I'll tell you, I got some pretty big shocks. Yeah. And no one had prepared me. And it's hard to live with things, and, and you have nobody to ask when you okay. get to a certain age. There's nobody around. Look, look. I'm going to be 89 in a couple yep. of months. Congratulations. <laughs> so, so look, why don't you send, uh, if you don't mind, send a note to that email address, yes. and we'll sit up and have a cup of coffee sometime, okay? That would be marvelous. That's the best way to do it justice. I, did you ever read, uh, Dr. Zeus wrote a book about growing old. Have you, honestly. He was before my time. Yes. <laughs> but, but one of the sections he talked about was the pill drill. You know, like trying to keep in, in order all the pills he had to take. I'll tell you one of the biggest shocks is booze. <laughs> <laughs> I had a pretty good chest. Okay. And then when I hit about 82 or 83, they dropped. Well, <laughs> well I, I think our live streaming has got X-rated right now. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Can, can you just hope? Yes. Is there, any, is there any connection between longevity and personality? The reason I ask is I skate in the winter and I golf in the summer, and the 90-year-olds and late 80 year olds that I golf and skate with are type A personalities. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there is there any proven connection? Yeah, there is. That? Um, th there, there have been a number of studies done in people who live to be 100 or greater, and they looked at kind of what predicted that. I mean, one is having good genes, that came up earlier. Uh, another one was um, having good health habits. Like, no men live to be 100 if they were a smoker. Some women did, like the Queen Mother, but, uh, but no men did. They ha you had to have good health habits if you're a male. But they also found personality traits. And, and being more um, uh, you know, able to deal with, with things which happen in life and not dwell on it unduly, and moving on, looking forward, was really important. There was a gentleman I saw a number of years ago when, remember Queen Elizabeth had the uh, Diamond Jubilee medals? And this gentleman was winning an award, and, he was 97 and got the medal, and I was uh, talking to his daughter afterwards, and then she said, well, I have to run right now. I said, well, why? So well, Dad's going home. He's working on his five-year plan. <laughs> you know, he, he was looking forward, always looking forward. Yeah. Sorry. Is there uh, Maybe here, yes. Okay, here, here's my question. Do you think the whole darn thing might be skewed because people who would volunteer for this type of study would tend to be keeners are that a little more keen about their health yeah, you always have that with volunteers in a study volunteers are different than people who don't volunteer absolutely and but but one one way around that you try to make the study big enough that there's a range of characteristics in people in the study and 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 you still hopefully will get useful information but you're right volunteers are different than people who don't volunteer we also know that there's other biases in the study. We already talked about the issue of um, rural and remote communities. We also have you know, indigenous populations. We also, you have to be proficient in English or French. And uh, you know, immigrant populations would be, tend to be underrepresented. I mean, one thing we want to do in the, um, the data here in Calgary is to look how skewed it is. Because we'll compare you know, the, the characteristics of the population who go into the study in Calgary to the overall population of the same age in Calgary. So we know how different it is. It, you still, I think, will get useful information, but it's not going to answer every possible question you might have about aging in our country. There's no way it's going to do that. But it's still a very important study. But it's a great point that you make. Yeah. Uh, yes. doc, Dr. Hogan, yes. your, my comment, your re just comments just now, or anticipated my comment, is that when I look around the room, Sadly, there are very, very few people of color, 
and I suspect very few recent immigrants or first generation immigrants and yet the future of Canada mm -hmm. is a different color and uh, from many many countries so I think that the study is not is not collecting that data mm -hmm. that's right and and obviously that's a you know there are potential solutions or remedies for these problems like for example it may be that in a few years there'll be targeted recruitment you know to try to bring in people from you know from different backgrounds into the study um, but that hasn't been addressed or answered yet. But, but I, I can reassure you that, that people in the study are aware of this, and, and, uh, and obviously we're, we would wish it was a more representative population, but it is what it is. But, that, but I also want to say that I really am appreciative for all of you for being in the study. So don't go anywhere, stay. <laughs> okay. okay, there's one here. Uh, thank you. This question has to do with the cost of this study because it is longitudinal. Um, do you know how much it's going to cost per person that's involved in the study? Yeah, I, you know, to be honest with you, it, it'd probably be best, let me look it up and can you send me an email and I'll send that to you? Because uh, rather than trying to pull it out of the air, let me look at it and get back to you about that. Okay, I'll do that. And question back here again. Um, I just want to follow up on one comment made earlier about sharing with uh, government uh, agencies, policy makers, uh, your thoughts maybe on being able to sh share the information with physicians and educators. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking here about as, as early as elementary, if we're talking about the impact of um, healthy uh, mental state and, and healthy living, might as well start early, so the benefits of sharing it with educators. Yeah. Um, it's a little, uh, just w another comment, um, you mentioned uh, phase two and taking consideration of suggestions and other comments, questions that might be introduced, and having the impression that you gotta add one, you gotta take one away. In terms of the time I spend answering the questionnaire or the time I spend in the clinic, I would, and this is just a personal opinion, I would suggest if you want to add a couple questions, don't take two away. Okay. We, we've got time to do this. This is serious stuff. I, I just want to make a, mention, a couple comments about that. Is when we look at changing, well, we're getting input from the researchers. We also looked at all the comments made from the staff, but also participants. And, and, and things they thought should be added or things which weren't quite right from their perspective. That's always been looked at very seriously. Um, one way uh, around this is that rather than maybe asking all 30,000 odd people the same set of questions, the addition, we might be doing what are called sub-studies, like you know, uh, recruiting people from the larger group who would be willing to do that extra, that extra work or go through that extra evaluation. The other thing that's being looked at is, is uh, allowing people to maybe do uh, the in-home interviews um, through a web-based format. You know, be logging on, doing it yourself, you know, rather than having you know, to go through the interview itself. That's something else that's being considered and looked at. And also for people who become less able to come into the DCS, we are now doing what we call the DCS at home for people who can't come. Though we have to keep that quite limited, but we want to keep as many people as we can within the study because we don't want a high attrition rate because that will just undermine even more so the study. But, but your comment about uh, aging as, as sort of a societal issue is a really important one. And uh, I remember when I was in training a long time ago, going to a high school and talking about aging to a bunch of 16-year-olds, and my God, they thought 30 was aging. <laughs> But it's a challenge, but it should be done. Yes? I just had a couple of quick questions. One was just out of curiosity, has there been much dropout rate or attrition rate? No, uh, the attrition rate is very low. It's, okay. it's uh, less than predicted. Oh, I'm glad uh, to hear and, that. And uh, Canadians are great joiners. <laughs> um, a number of longitudinal studies which were launched uh, around the world about the same time as CLSA, 
were, were canned, were stopped because they had so much trouble recruiting. But in Canada, um, people like yourself have volunteered for the study, are participating in the study, and it's a great reflection for us as a country and for all of you. And thank you very much. Now, I should tell you, I, I, one thing I want to have to tell you is that I have trouble telling directions. I can only hear out of one ear. So, so when I, sometimes I'm looking at the wrong spot when people are talking. So I apologize. I had another quick question, and yep. that was about family history. Yep. To my recollection, I've not yet been asked about family history. Yeah. Is that deliberate? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a sore point for me. I think that's a big lack in the study and has to be added. Um, but the difficulty is trying to find the right type of uh, family history format for getting this information. But it's been identified as a, as a clear hole right now. I agree with you entirely. It's hard to have an aging study without a good family history. My question is actually yeah. for the lady who's doing the research on pet ownership. Yes. And I just wondered if you've had any, um, what kind of impact has pet ownership on healthy aging? I, think I, guess, I guess I'll go check my emails now. <laughs> well, I think the answer is quite actually complicated and that um, there are, um, there's evidence for some really interesting benefits. There's some evidence for some challenges. Um, as has been a little bit of the theme of the night, a lot of it is sort of contextual, contextually dependent or depend, well, for instance, um, this, this isn't the work that I'm doing, but studies have shown things like for older adults who have lower amounts of social support, having a pet might support their mental health as they're going through a crisis or some sort of grief. So you really have to get quite specific. Um, some of my work uh, prior to accessing the CLSA was actually looking at a fairly straightforward um, activity, which would be dog walking and just you know, the, the physical activity support, the um, social interactions, uh, the mental health and companionship. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's one of those um, social phenomena that is, it, it doesn't have a black and white um, yes and no answer, but um, I'm very interested to try and, and try, try and understand it more because even as a phenomenon, our views of pets are shifting and changing over time. I should mention Anne's working and very close to the end of her PhD, and your thesis defense is coming up, and good luck. Yes. Thank you. Uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, there's a finite life to the study, and obviously you can't go on forever. I think by my calculation it's about 2000 and 25 or so that the mm -hmm. study will end. Uh, by that time, a great number of people in this room will still be alive. So I know that the study is focusing on a lot of things like the quality of life and chronic problems and, and, and those sorts of things. But I think people would also be interested to know about mortality. Mm -hmm. And so is there any plan that following the, the, the end of the term to track uh, the people in the study to determine how long they actually do live and, and use that data in in some yeah. fashion. Definitely mortality is being tracked, but the other thing that's being looked at in the study is we're, we're looking at end of life and, and the care and, um, and, and people's perception of it. Now clearly we're getting this more from um, a loved one who knew the person and they're giving their perception. Um, it's a, it, end of life is something that unfortunately is going to happen to all of us. I don't want, we don't dwell on it, but it's something that's going to occur. But I think all of us want it to be um, as meaningful as possible and with us in, in control as much as possible. So um, right now in Canada is a very interesting area you know, because of medically assisted death and how that's going to roll out, what impact that's going to have on our society, it's unknown. But there's a, a particular module now that has been developed to look at end of life stages. And um, anyone who unfortunately passes away who have been in the study will be collecting that information on them. And as the study goes on, we'll have more and more and more information, and we'll be able to track changes over time. And we can also look at differences across the country. So 
Yes. Yes. Yep. It should be, yes. Yes. Uh, could you comment on the age distribution of the 50,000 participants and your feelings on any uh, shortcomings in that distribution? For example, if there's uh, just not that, you, you mentioned 45 to 85. Is yep. there a, a real uh, paucity of, of uh, participants in the 45 to 55 year old range? Yeah, it, 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 it more or less mirrors the published distribution in Canada. But a group that was harder to recruit were the younger men. You know, men 45, 55, uh, they, they were just harder to pull in. By and large, in volunteer studies, we talked a bit about volunteer studies, women volunteer more than men. And, and men of working age often feel they're too busy, have other demands on their time. They just then kind of march up to the counter as other population groups did. So that's a relative deficiency. Still a lot of, of younger men, but, but not as many, and it was harder to recruit as compared to other uh, demographics. <laughs> so, if not, look, we've, we've come to the witching hour, 8.30. I really would like to thank all of you for coming. It was great, uh, great questions, uh, a lot of just for thought. And, uh, and any of you have any follow-up questions or anything you didn't want to raise in a large group, please send an email. Thanks again.